Hi everybody, welcome back. In this lecture, I'd like to extend the notions of liability systems as distinguishers between efficient and inefficient cost imposition from the tort system to the system of criminal liability, the criminal process, and the criminal courts and prisons. I'll begin to address four important questions about criminal liability. How do crimes impose costs? And in particular, how do the costs imposed by crimes differ from the costs that are imposed by torts? Whose entitlement and to what exactly is taken when someone commits a crime? And finally, how does the system of criminal liability work? And how are punishments understood as criminal liability prices fixed and with what effect. Let's begin by talking about an example that elaborates on the problem that I identified at the end of the last lecture. <clears throat> Here's a picture of a very, very tall staircase on a beach in Denmark. And I'll ask you to imagine two particular situations, different situations that might occur on this staircase. Okay. In the first situation, you're standing at the top of the staircase, way up there, so you see it way up there, and you're just standing at the top of the staircase looking down toward the beach. And I walk by behind you, and as I'm walking, I'm talking with somebody else, and as a result of that, I'm not looking where I'm going, and unintentionally, not purposefully, but carelessly, I bump into you, you fall down the stairs all the way down to the bottom, and it kills you. So in the first hypothetical case, I have negligently, but not purposefully, pushed you down the stairs to your death. In the second case, forget about the first one, once again, you're standing at the top of the stairs, and I walk by you from behind. This time, however, rather than accidentally pushing you down the stairs carelessly, I purposefully and intentionally, meaning to cause you grievous injury, push you down the stairs, and sure enough, you fall all the way down the stairs to your death. So here are two situations, and we'll ask the question of each, is it an accident or is it a crime? The first thing to notice about, about it is that what's obviously different in the two cases is my intention. In the first case, my intention was not to knock you down the stairs. Indeed, it's almost certainly the case that I regretted it instantly and wished that I hadn't done it. In the second case, however, I intentionally pushed you down the stairs and I must have looked with some satisfaction at your dead body at the bottom of the stairs. But from your point of view, after the accident, it makes not a dime's worth of difference. You're dead in either case. Whether my action was intentional or whether my action was accidental, at the end of the day, you were pushed down the stairs by me and you are dead. Okay. But obviously, the first of these is just an accident. Even though it's a careless accident, even though I'm at fault for my negligence or carelessness, it's just an accident. And as a result, you can sue me in tort to rec you or your survivors, you are dead, your survivors can sue me in court for the value of the entitlement I've taken from you. You have an entitlement not to lose your life at the hands of the negligent or careless acts of me. And by taking your life through a negligent or careless act, I've obviously seized your entitlement to be free from the costs of my doing that. And as we've seen, the liability system is there so that you or your survivors can recover the value of that entitlement from me. And that's what will happen in a wrongful death tort suit at the end of the accidental occurrence that I've described. One interesting point about the wrongful death suit is that the wrongful death is treated as an economic good. That is, if you or your survivors win the tort case against me, I will be forced to pay a monetary judgment which reflects the economic value of the entitlement that you've lost, or more colloquially, the economic value of your death. 
so that the liability system is capable of, accurately or inaccurately, is capable of placing an economic value even on such a precious thing as a human life. And a wrongful death tort suit will evaluate in terms of all sorts of different kinds of evidence what the economic value of your life was in this circumstance, and that's the amount that I'll be asked to pay, possibly with a little kicker for pain and suffering to your survivors. Okay? But notice the second case where I intentionally push you down the stairs. That's a crime. Indeed, that's a murder, because I have purposefully and intentionally committed an act which I knew would lead to your grievous bodily harm or your death. That's a classic definition of first degree murder. So the second incident, the intentional pushing is a crime. You're dead, just as you were in the first case, but this is a much more serious matter. Notice, however, that if I commit the murder, I've also committed the tort. That is, the murder includes the tort of wrongful death. The tort of wrongful death does not rise to the level of murder, but every murder includes within it a wrongful death. And so the murder, the second incident, is actually two transactions. A transaction representing the tort liability, which could be undertaken whether I'm ever arrested for the crime or not, and a second proceeding over a second set of entitlements which I've taken as a result of the intentionality of the act, the thing that has elevated the act from a simple tort to a murder. The murder, that is, imposes costs on more than just the individual who has suffered the direct harm of the act itself. So the question is, who else bears the costs of crime and how do these other cost bearers bear those costs? How may people other than what we might call the direct victim of a crime suffer? Let's speak about the victim of the crime that we've just been talking about, whom I'm calling you. You are the, 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 excuse me, the direct victim of the crime. You're the one who has suffered the economic cost of the wrongful death at my hands. But other people other than you may also suffer economic costs as a result of my crime. So for example, if as a result of my crime, your neighbors are now frightened of me, they may put locks on their door, they may get a gun to protect themselves against me, and they may alter their lives in some way to account for what they now see as the danger that I will commit the crime I committed against you against them as well. And all of these costs, these purchases or adjustments in the way that people live, would not have been undertaken without the fact of the crime, and therefore these economic costs are in fact imposed by the crime itself. But the economic costs of crime typically pale in comparison to what I will call the moral cost of crime, at which I hinted at the end of the last lecture. Moral costs represent the outrage that is felt by people who are not directly party to the crime, but who feel that an injustice has been done to the victim of the crime. So, for example, if I am on the street and I watch somebody commit a forcible robbery on another person, even if I can't stop the robbery, I may say to myself, that was a terrible thing for that person to do. That person has inflicted a serious cost on his victim. He's done so without justification. People ought not to behave that way, and that man deserves to be punished. Everybody's experienced these kinds of costs. People are outraged frequently at what other people do. But crimes seem to generate, certainly amongst people who observe them closely, crimes seem to generate a special kind of rage. Crime makes the rest of us feel impotent. It makes us feel that we can't stop somebody from doing something we despise to people that we ultimately care about, that is, innocent people like ourselves. 
And so moral costs arise, not because people are protecting themselves in the face of crime, not because people are doing anything different in the face of crime than they would do otherwise, but simply because the knowledge that a crime has been committed makes them unhappier. It makes them think that the moral order of the universe has been disturbed by somebody and that that person is responsible for the outrage and disturbance that his act has caused. And moral cost typically generates a desire for revenge or vengeance against the person who has inflicted these costs. And note that the costs, the direct costs of the crime, don't have to be inflicted upon you nor do you ever have to be a potential victim of these crimes in order to suffer the moral costs. So, for example, rapes are almost always committed by men against women. It is very unusual for a rape to be committed against a man. And so when a man hears about a rape, he typically doesn't feel frightened for his own physical safety at the hands of the rapist. But he may well feel a terrible moral outrage at the fact of the rape, at the violation of an innocent person at the hands of another in a particularly humiliating and discomforting way. It's that outrage that crime creates that I'm calling moral cost. Moral costs are real, as I've suggested. People feel them even though they're ugly. One of the differences between retribution and deterrence as justifications for criminal punishment is that in the 20th and 21st centuries, rep uh, retribution has come to have a bad reputation. Reputation is about vengeance. It's bloody, it's nasty, it's harsh, and people typically are uncomfortable in its presence. Deterrence seems a little bit more anodyne, if you will. It's a little bit calmer. It's not quite as threatening a notion as retribution, not quite as fearsome an objective of the criminal process, and it's cast in terms of economics, typically, that is. We want efficient deterrence. We want to deter the most crime for the least cost. It seems more like a modern objective for a criminal justice system than retribution, which seems to harken back to the bad old days of the Old West when people took the law into their own hands. Vengeance may be ugly. We may wish we didn't have feelings of vengeance, but we do, and moral costs are real. And when crimes are committed, people demand redress for those crimes. When a serious crime has been committed in a community, everybody in the community who is aware of the crime feels violated by it and feels that outrage and hatred at the criminal for the act that he has committed. So to know moral costs is not to love them. That is to say, to believe that moral costs exist and that they play an important role in the determination of criminal liability is not the same thing as to say you or I approve of a particular instance of moral cost or that you and I think people are justified in feeling the moral cost that they do. Moral costs are strongly conditioned by the full range of attitudes, practices, experiences, prejudices, religious feelings, historical, past and so on of every society. Different societies have different attitudes. People in different societies are outraged by different sorts of things. Americans look at what people get angry about in other parts of the world and wonder what people are so excited about there, why they're so angry and vice versa. People in other parts of the world look at America with wonder at what it is that Americans get exercised about morally and what they don't get exercised about morally. Some moral costs are the product of raw prejudice. So for example, if I'm racially prejudiced, then I might take particular outrage when a person of my race is attacked by a person of the other race, which I don't like. We may, as observers, say that nobody should have feelings like that, and we may be right. But people do have feelings like that, and the criminal justice system expresses those feelings for good or ill. 
people in one society or region may strongly disapprove of the way people in other parts of the world or other parts of that same society experience moral costs at the hands of offenders. But those costs are real and we can't turn our heads away from them if we want to understand how the criminal process actually works. So we're not talking about criminal liability in terms of moral costs in order to say that this is a good thing or to say that it's a bad thing. Rather, we're trying to say that this is the way that the criminal justice system works. If we want to understand how criminal liability works, then we must come to terms with the existence of the moral costs of crime and the role of the criminal justice system in internalizing these costs. Economists distinguish between what they call positive and normative styles of analysis. Positive analysis is scientific in the sense that its object is to determine how things actually are, what the world is really like, what's real and what's not real, irrespective of how we might feel about it. So, for example, I might not like it that some people kill other people for no good reason, and yet, I'd be a fool if I denied that such things actually happened in the world. A positive sentence is, murders are created in the world. A normative sentence would be, murders ought not to be committed. Normative statements are not about how things are, but about how the speaker thinks things ought to be. So a normative statement is in the nature of things a criticism of how things actually are or a prescription of how things ought to be in the future. And normative analysis is in this sense obviously very different from positive analysis. So our discussion of criminal liability is not normative. It's not meant to say this is a good way to organize the criminal justice system or a bad way to organize the criminal justice system. It's not to say that any instance of moral cost is laudable or despicable to be applauded or to be condemned. It's simply to say, this is how the system of criminal liability works, and this is the role that is played in it by the imposition of moral costs by criminal acts. When we make a positive description of how the system of criminal liability works, we can reduce the description to a series of propositions that analogize closely to the way in which the system of tort liability works. One, the generation of moral costs in a given society is the essential characteristic of a crime. What distinguishes a crime from a tort is the existence of more victims in the case of the crime than the tort. The tort has a direct victim who suffers only economic cost. A crime is typically a tort, so it has a direct victim who typically suffers an economic cost. But crimes intrinsically have another class of victims whom we'll call indirect victims, and they are in principle all of the other members of the society who in principle form an audience for every criminal act and react to it by bearing moral costs. When a murder is committed anywhere in Connecticut, ideally the law assumes that every citizen of the state of Connecticut is aware of the murder and every citizen of the state of Connecticut has borne a substantial moral cost as a result of that crime. It's the generation of these moral costs, the generation of outrage, the generation of a sense of injustice, and the generation of a desire for revenge that is the essential characteristic of every crime. Secondly, the internalization of moral costs born not by the direct victim of the crime, but by the many indirect victims, what I've described as the audience to the crime, is the essential task of criminal liability. The job of the tort liability system is to mediate the transaction between the cost imposer and the cost imposer's direct victim, the one who has suffered the direct economic costs of the tort. 
The purpose of a criminal liability proceeding is, on the other hand, not to compensate the direct victim. That's handled by the tort system. The purpose of the criminal liability proceeding is to compensate the indirect victims of the crime, those who have borne the moral costs of the act. They are not directly party to the crime because the actual physical act, as it were, has not been committed against them. But as citizens of the jurisdiction, they're assumed to know about the crime, to have observed the crime happening, and to be morally outraged by its occurrence. And the purpose of the system of criminal liability is one, to recognize that the indirect victims have a, an entitlement to be free of the moral costs imposed by crimes. And secondly, once that entitlement has been taken by a criminal to organize a liability payment on the part of the criminal that compensates the large class of indirect victims for the costs that they've suffered, the moral costs that they've suffered at the hands of the offender. And thirdly, liability prices in the criminal system are determined and exacted so as to compensate these indirect victims in kind, a term I'll explain in a moment, and to distinguish efficient from inefficient crimes and to discourage only the latter. To summarize, individual tort liability internalizes economic costs that are concentrated in a few direct cost bearers. Class action tort liability internalizes the economic costs that are spread across many direct cost bearers. Like a class action, criminal liability internalizes not economic costs on direct victims, but the moral costs which are borne by and spread across many indirect victims of the crime, the members of the audience who bear outrage and a sense of injustice and a desire for vengeance at the commission of the crime. And all of this, both tort and criminal liability, is ideally not to deter all cost imposition <clears throat> or indeed all unlawful cost imposition absolutely, but to distinguish efficient unlawful cost imposition from inefficient unlawful cost imposition and to use the liability price to discourage the latter and encourage the former.